and IIT Bombay. Uh, today in Power Hour, we have a very eminent uh, leader from healthcare startup ecosystem, Dr. Geeta Manjunath with us. Uh, she will share with us the journey of our startup Niramai, which stands for Non-Invasive Risk Assessment with Machine Intelligence. Uh, the, uh, her uh, talk will be followed by conversation with uh, Science CEO, Ms. Poinipat. And uh, towards the end of the session, we'll have a few questions from the audience also. So briefly, I will introduce Dr. Geeta. Uh, she's a founder, CEO, and a CTO of Niramai Health Analytics. Uh, the current focus of Niramai is in development of a novel solution for detecting early stage breast cancer using machine learning techniques. She has over 25 years of experience in IT research and has led many innovative projects in healthcare and transportation especially catering to the emerging market needs. Until end of 2016, she was a lab director heading data analytics research in Xerox India. Prior to that, she was a principal research scientist at uh, HP Laboratories for 17 years and member of the CDAC team, which built the first commercial supercomputer from India. Uh, academically, she is a doctorate in computer science from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and uh, later she has uh, pursued a management uh, education at Kellogg School of Management, Chicago. She has won many international and national recognition for her innovations and extrapreneurial work. She was awarded the Computer Society of India gold medal in 1991. She was named as one of the top 15 NASCOM IT innovators in 2009 she was also the winner of the 2010 MIT Tech Review Grand Challenges for Technologist in Healthcare category. She has co-authored a book on cloud technologies called Moving to the Cloud. And she is a senior member of IEEE and past chair of IEEE Computer Society, uh, Bangalore chapter. She is the inventor of 15 uh, US patents with more pending uh, patents on her name as of now. And she was awarded one of the Bayrak's uh, uh, winner award in 2018 for her entrepreneurial research. Recently, she has also featured in the Forbes India uh, Woman Power Self-Made Woman uh, list of 2020. So a very warm, warm welcome to Dr. Geeta here. Thank you very much, Dr. Shada. Ma'am, I would request you to share your screen uh, for the presentation. Sure. So, um, I guess basically, uh, initially what I'll do is in about 15 minutes or so, I will give a kind of an introduction uh, to uh, Niramai. Uh, some of you may already know, you would have heard me in some forum. But trust me, uh, the first thing you will hear uh, from an entrepreneur is to sort of grab any stage any audience and talk about the, the child, which is Niramai in this case, right? So that's uh, that's what I'm going to do. And um, yeah, so so many of you uh, you know would ask what is Niramai? Niramai in Sanskrit means being healthy. Um, there is a saying in um, Rig Veda which says, uh, Sarve Santu Niramaya. Okay, let everyone be healthy, right? That's our motto. Uh, we also wanted to make it a little more um, sort of uh, you know, interesting uh, outside India. So there is an expansion, which uh, Dr. Shadda already mentioned, non-invasive risk assessment through machine artificial intelligence. So using AI to non-invasively detect uh, health risk is our uh, main goal. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, how I started this and all that, you know, Poini is, you know, I'm going to have a conversation with Poini and we will talk about that. But let's get to sort of what we do and, and how we do it uh, to some extent. We, I, I'll be happy to share. Um, AI, the AI for uh, predictive analytics and so on is, is picking up, right, in healthcare particularly. And uh, so, so what we are attempting to do is to use AI for detecting health risks in a clinical decision support manner um, and uh, do it in a very non-invasive way. And the first problem we are attacking uh, is breast cancer. It is uh, one of the largest cancer killers. I mean, um, more than half a million women, actually 600,000 women die every year because of this disease. Um, the number 
one in uh, um, seven in the US, one in 17 globally, one in 25 India, whatever it is, right? So there are so many women who are getting affected uh, with uh, breast cancer. The unfortunate thing is that uh, most women in India are detecting so late that the survival rate is just about 50%. Every alternate lady detected with breast cancer is dying in India. Whereas this is one of the very few cancers which can be completely cured, you know, okay, or completely cured if detected early, right? So we do have uh, a completely manageable cancer, but still we are losing 600,000 every year. And uh, 86 to 90,000 women out of this is right out of India. It's, it's a huge, huge loss we are losing. And many, many of them uh, could have lived longer. Only thing is they should detect early. Unfortunately, what happens is that uh, women wait till there is a huge lump which they are, you know, accidentally feeling, and uh, they realize it is growing, and that's when they, you know, uh, start coming to the hospital or telling their family members. This basically means that in order to palp, like in order to feel it with the hand, it has to be five millimeters in size, which by definition of what's called as TLM staging is stage three or stage four, depends on the metastasis. Now. First question, uh, uh, obviously, is like, why is early detection not possible? What are the gaps in the current methods? Uh, there is, a, first of all, a technical or a physics limitation of the current method, which is the current default standard method called mammography, which is the test used uh, where uh, an X-ray of the breast is taken with a compression, you know, two plates are used and X-rays are passed from top. And, and an X-ray would look something like this. You have two images here. Uh, the first one is a 60-year-old, the second one is a 45-year-old. Here, it's actually fairly okay to find this white spot, right? Even with the bare eye, the radiologist is able to figure out there's something wrong. The radiologist is more uh, also, of course, expert in figuring out which white spot is cancerous. You know, X-ray, obviously, you'll see dense things as white, right? Now, dense is the smallest of the lumps, uh, like microcalcifications, we call it, in, and so on. Now, what happens in younger women is that the whole breast is appearing white because of a lot of fibroglandular tissue. How do you find a white spot? That's a major physics kind of a limitation that we cannot use density differences to detect uh, breast cancer in, in women under 45 years of age. In fact, many women, more than 50% of the ladies, even above 45, have dense breasts. And dense breasts, unfortunately, is also high risk for cancer. So you can't say, I won't touch breast, but, you know, I won't even sort of screen dense breasts because that's that's the pool we have to be concerned about. And that's where mammography doesn't work. I mean, otherwise it works beautifully. I mean, it's it's there for 30 years and so on and so forth. The second big thing is that obviously from a developing world standpoint, like countries in, like India, a 3,500 rupees test is, is a lot of money for somebody to spend every year to get a test done. And so, uh, you know, people run away like, you know, why should I spend it? spend that money because I will not get cancer. This is, remember, this is early stage. That means it's almost like a preventative screening, uh, you know, like a general health checkup you do every month, every year or so. So that is sort of, uh, for that, you know, it's, it's a lot of money. Is there a chat I should be aware of? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, so, so then, um, uh, sorry. Um, then there is an accessibility journey because a machine itself is about one crore rupees and how many diagnostic centers can be, you know, can, can buy that uh, to actually even provide it to their uh, patients. So that is where there is a huge accessibility challenge. Only big hospitals are able to um, buy this machine, mammography machine. And so, you know, it is out of reach for rural, uh, rural India, for example. Of course, there are mammography vans and so on, which cost two and a half crores, and so you need sponsors for it. You know, there are solutions, but, you know, the affordability uh, uh, to have an accessible solution is also an issue. And um, last but not the least, uh, there is a radiation exposure, uh, which uh, basically means that uh, because going through an X-ray, um, again and again, exposing them actually can increase the so that's where uh, we have an issue um, that 90% of the ladies on earth detect cancer by hand, which is unfortunate in this technologically evolved uh, era, I would say. So now how do we address this 90% uh, of the people, uh, if we can actually solve at least one of these problems, we are able to sort of at least increase the pie. What uh, I'm happy to share is that uh, at Niramai, we have developed a solution 
uh, which uh, can address all of the uh, previously stated problems. Early detection is very key, we mentioned. Yes, uh, our solution is able to do, uh, uh, you know, detect early stage breast cancer because we are able to detect four millimeters of cancer, four millimeters and five millimeters of cancer, which is one fifth the size of a lump uh, that you can feel by hand. So it's much, much early. By definition, this is stage zero or stage one. Uh, depends on how many such uh, uh, you know lumps you have and so on. Uh, we also wanted to address the shyness associated with doing a breast cancer screening. Uh, you know, in order to disrobe in front of others and all, it's obviously very, very uh, you know uncomfortable. Um, so we made it completely non-contact, non-invasive. Nobody sees the person, nobody touches the person, and it's completely privacy aware. I call it like a um, um, changing room experience. You just sort of go into a, like a mall and try out different clothes. It's something very similar. Just go into a booth um, with the door and so on. And uh, after 10 minutes, uh, you know, your report will be ready. So it's completely, or, or, you know, semi-automated. I would say, I don't want to say completely automated uh, because there is a technician, but technician is also not inside the booth. Nobody sees, not even a technician. The other important part of that is that we do not use x-rays. X-rays had two problems, if you recall. One is the fact that a density difference is not sufficient for detecting breast cancer under 45 years of age. So, so when we do not use X-rays, we are able to detect, uh, you know, um, cancers in all types of women. I'll tell you what we do. And uh, definitely there's no radiation, so it's more safe. What we do instead of X-rays is to actually measure the temperature variations on the chest uh, using a thermal imaging device. You would have seen a thermal imaging device, uh, obviously, let's say maybe in, 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 in uh, videos of airports uh, doing COVID screening and so on. So this is just a thermometer. Uh, sort of, you know, it's, it's uh, three feet from the person, three, three to 10 feet from the person, and the, uh, the infrared imaging device can just measure this temperature emanating from our body. There are no rays put in put. It's just the temperature. It's just a remote thermometer, right? So that's what we do. And what you're seeing here is a small view of the frontal view of the person. Here, it, it's basically heat map. And some of you are scientists here uh, in the audience, I'm assuming. So you'll know what a heat map is. To actually visualize a bunch of data, you can always do it in a way that you give a color to a particular range of values. You can say 37 to 37.5 degrees is red color. 36.5 to 37 is yellow color. So you can actually automatically allot different colors and then show all the data in a colorful image. That's what you're seeing here. It is basically the temperature variations on the different tissues, uh, roughly, on the chest area. And that is done one snapshot. You can actually sort of make the person move. So we actually take five snapshots. Having said that, what you're seeing is here. Here is a single snapshot. <laughs> Together, we are able to detect up to 400,000 temperature. It's a lot of data. Yes, we detect that. And we made it very affordable and accessible. The cost of the hardware, which I mentioned earlier about one CR for mammography, is less than six, seven lakhs here. So it's a it's a extremely like almost like one twentieth the cost of a mammogram that we are able to get. And most and, and, and most importantly, it's a very small device. It's it's uh, as big as a uh, you know one liter water bottle you would have. And so you can just put it in your walk, uh, backpack and take it along and do the screening, not just inside hospital. It can also be done. Outside. So these are all the sort of the positives of it. Obviously, we'll say like, what's the smart, right? Uh, so we have developed this technology, we call it Thermalytics, which is a combination of AI learning with uh, thermal imaging. So we do uh, measure the temperature variations. As I mentioned before, we get a thermal image, a bunch of thermal images per person. Uh, this is a thermal camera. Uh, then we have done AI on this to actually detect any abnormality that exists. It's not very obvious. Uh, as soon as you see a thermal image, you will not be able to say whether somebody is cancerous or not, unless she's almost like stage five or something. Uh, but uh, what happens is that when there is a lesion or a cancer cell, it grows at a very high uh, abnormal rate. And so there is an increase in metabolism and increase in temperature at that point. That can be captured in this thermal imaging. And then we also do several analysis on the thermal image uh, to detect uh, vascularity and look at uh, you know, uh, blood vessel flow and so on and so forth. All this, using this, uh, we are able to generate a complete report automatically uh, where we actually also mark the area of potential malignancy and say probability that it is malignant. All this uh, has resulted in uh, nine granted patents for Niramine. Uh, it's basically computer aided diagnostics. We take a bunch of images, the uh, patient demographic data, and, and any other historical complaints that she has, family cancer history, or any of those. 
to uh, learning model to generate a report. I think that's very, very critical. We generate a report and the report uh, sometimes actually is uh, sent to a doctor for review uh, on, a, on his mobile and once he reviews the report, um, the report is given to the end user completely. Automatically, that screening test can be done by simple skill people like this. You know, it's installed in 60 plus hospitals. Uh, these uh, women, like nursing staff, can be trained to do this. And this is the device you're seeing. It's connected to the cloud, and all the uh, AI happens on uh, on the cloud. Uh, we can also, as I mentioned, do this test uh, in corporate screening or home screening. Actually, we have launched a home screening, one on one home screening. Uh, now, because uh, of COVID, people are not coming to the hospital and we're seeing good uptake already. Uh, so you see that there are two booths here. This technologist or technician, sorry, is outside. She's manning this, uh, this, this particular booth. Nobody's inside. And we also have Pink Express, which is a mobile uh, van, which takes uh, our solution to uh, several rural camps also. The mobile van is not necessary, but that is one more. This did the Nirama yeah, technology to me. Having heard about it, I went to get a checkup done. I was quite the screen before I went for the test. It took me by surprise because uh, the machines didn't touch me. It was all happening from far away. Just say eye test hote na, dur se, bilkul waisa. So it's a very simple procedure. She just sits there, and so from my experience perspective, it's a very very important. And obviously, the next question you would have is, does it work really? You know, how does it compare with the standard of care? Yes, we have tried this on. 32,000 uh, women so far uh, and uh, done uh, marquee trials at uh, HCG, which is one of the cancer specialist uh, chain of hospitals. Um, and at the LAI, you probably know them. And many other hospitals, we have actually partnered with them to do trials. Uh, we have six international clinical trial publications, which show high sensitivity and specificity, uh, better than uh, several of the current uh, uh, screening methodologies that exist today. Uh, and we have got clearances from the government uh, bodies in India. Uh, being the government or uh, also, uh, you know, the regulatory body as well. And also, you know, several cancer societies. Uh, we have won multiple awards, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Shraddha did mention about Bayrek, uh, you know, which uh, was also awarded for the work that uh, we are doing at Niramai. Uh, we have also received Bill Melinda Gates Foundation grant for using this technology for a different problem, right? So because what we have done is thermal imaging followed by um, AI, and that's not limited uh, to, to breast cancer. We have tried uh, diff several other diseases, and uh, so Bill Melinda Gates Foundation grant is for one such disease called rigor blindness. Um, several things. I'm happy to talk about how we did this and all when we have the chat. And, and then my is this one, uh, which is basically uh, Nirama is the only Indian startup listed on the top 100 AI startups in the world. Uh, this is a CV Insights coming to the list, came up in this list. It's not like we applied and they said, hey, you are the best one. So they actually lived out and then they made this list. And I, I, you know, I was told just when they announced it. So, uh, you know, I'm very happy that, uh, you know, and proud that uh, Niramai is able to put India on the uh, AI world map. Uh, so with that uh, sort of, you know, I'll be happy to take any questions and, you know, uh, really, um, Looking forward to chatting with uh, uh, Dr. Poyne. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Gita. This is amazing, very inspirational startup that we have. Especially like, you know, uh, lots of startup activities in India, like we see the buzz around, but we also see that all the while, the much of the activity was in like, you know, retail space and aggregation and those kind of things. Your case stands out so clearly as a deep tech startup, med tech startup, where people are, uh, it, it takes, uh, you know, um, the, uh, guts to venture out in an area which is so, so heavily deep tech and like, you know, uh, uh, difficult long gestation period, difficult to get the resources and so on and so forth. So it's amazing to know about, of course, I know about Niramai, but all those, uh, Participants here, like if some of you, some of them have not known you, I'm sure it must be quite a information that they are, like you know, uh, getting to know and must be inspired by your uh, startup and journey. Actually, yeah, uh, um, uh, one is that you have spoken about Niramai, but what I would like to basically, there are lots of innovators here, and then there are uh, entrepreneurs here. Uh, I would also like to basically, you know, uh, walk them through your journey per se, because like you, the, the way my colleague Shraddha 
um, uh, describe your profile you were out and out in a research like you know phd and then even your corporate jobs were into research and yes. like you know you have, you have authored the patents and all those things yeah. and starting is like it's a totally commercialization totally business orient orientation so the the shift of mindset and shift of approach and thinking required is very very different so can you just like you know share your your like your experience what motivated you to take a shift from uh, research to commercialization that's one thing and what are the changes in your personal mindset or outlook or thought process that were needed yeah uh, thank you it's great to chat with you um so yeah um i was a researcher you know i, I consider myself as a computer scientist uh, because i have always enjoyed doing something new thanks to iisc where the seeds were sown i mean i always say that i'm i'm sure it's true for iit bombay also right so every every leaf has uh, some saraswati <laughs> is what i feel right so so i mean so with that uh, you know and, and a clear push towards research and and, and also i think so many of you who are doing research will appreciate that there's a th sheer thrill of solving a tough problem as you know no compensation no money you know can give you that there's just sheer joy of doing new things and uh, solving tough problems you know that that's how i've always been and um, so starting from uh, cdac or hp you know, all of all of that is school was uh, innovation led uh, thing but uh, not academic research of course that's slightly different because i always enjoyed uh, uh, doing new things and seeing that it actually work and helps on a real on the ground problem you know tries to solve a real on the ground problem uh, of course i do have publications but i definitely do not have long list of publications maybe like 30 40 but not really like hundreds of them which uh, you know clearly uh, many researchers have done because my area of interest is uh, more in terms of how do we come up with one new thing of course to publish and make sure it's new and then see okay how do i make this real right now how can i really use this Uh, to solve the real problem, so that has always been uh, in in uh, you know in, in my mind. Um, so when I was at HP, it was Rock's uh, research. Uh, so so the way it translated is to sort of try and see how do we kind of find a business relevant problem where we can apply this technique and sort of you know make a uh, make a proposal for a some new product that or some new feature of a product that probably will materialize in in uh, uh, three years two years something like that so that has been uh, you know what we call as intrapreneur uh, kind of a thing uh, you know in me now uh, what happened uh, when i was at the rocks was that um, I, i was working with many doctors um, you know healthcare is one place you know where everyone feels a little more satis satisfied when we solve the problem there so i definitely was working on healthcare related problems uh, education customer care and um, also transportation related right smart cities and all uh, so uh, you know as a lab director i did have a good very smart group of people with whom i was working with as well um so at that time actually one of my cousin sisters got detected with breast cancer it's not like you know i mean um, she was actually very very close and she was not very uh, old uh, as such she was around 40ish and uh, uh, and then and it was very shocking because uh, when she detected it was really late stage they said probably 2 3 months left you know i mean it was a huge shock for me and i started just like anybody else would do i started reading up about breast cancer and then uh, another shock came within 6 months my husband's cousin got detected with breast cancer same around the same age because actually she was younger a small baby and all so i mean it really uh, uh, you know put me on to a thinking not i mean what, what am i doing here right you know and you know after doing so much uh, you know learning about several interesting algorithms you know why can't we do and solve some really important problems like this and so i started reading up discussed and then uh, started a small project uh, in my previous organization itself as a exploratory uh, project and um, you know spending nights and so on right outside office hours and all because uh, that's not just for the main project and uh, after about uh, one and a half to two years actually it took because you these things as you said you know there's a huge long gestation period and you also have to collaborate with hospitals to even get the first element of data right that you want all that of course it has its own uh, hassles so did that and um so so then i thought we were sitting on something that has a lot of potential 
to make a difference on the ground. So I quit my job and uh, it was a very hard decision because, uh, you know, they didn't want me to leave. And um, uh, so, so it took almost six years, six months to get relieved because, uh, you know, a lot of discussions and all. And then um, uh, started Niramai with a couple of my colleagues. So January 2017 is when we were on the ground, uh, you know, with no baggage of any brand saying, yeah, this corporate. And I realized what's the sort of also many things like HP and Xerox. Sometimes you wonder who you are, you know, are you an employee or a person, you know. So, right. so basically right on the ground, you know, as a startup, you know, the kind of initial uh, support and reaction you get is very different from when you actually go to a hospital as a HP employee or a Xerox employee. So it starts from that. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Yeah. To solve that problem, right? Once you know as to identify a problem and deeply feel about it, I think, uh, and this is, I guess, uh, common across all the entrepreneurs in the in the audience. You know, you really have to feel for the problem and say, okay, I will go all out to do that. Throw away whatever all the cushion I have, and then go all out to solve. And I guess that that's what happened. And I, I mean, it just happened, and I, I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, it's really good to know. In fact, uh, did I hear you correctly when you said you started on ground here in January 17? Yeah? yeah, three and a half Which years. Is like, yeah, so Nirami is just three and a half years old. Yeah. yeah? yeah. And uh, you talk about healthcare, you talk about medtech, the typical cycle is five to six years even to get the market. Whereas what, like you are already there in the market, I understand you are already doing revenue. Your, your international uh, visibility is already there, you know, across across globe also in not only uh, medtech space, also AI space and all those things. Such a short time. Like, and then uh, you had the same uh, challenges and problems that like you know, any other healthcare startup would have. You have required to go through uh, clinical trial. You have a regulatory approval and all those things. How, how basically did you manage so fast? Because uh, honestly, we don't come across even this kind of, you know, pace, even in generally non-healthcare area, but with deep, deep tech. So like on, in healthcare area, there are additional requirement of in, even compliances and all those things. How did you manage so fast? Yeah, it was... Um... Yeah, so so of course I can say you know I was lucky and of course I had all the grace around me, uh, and, and I did have support. Uh, but more objectively, I think it's about how you look at a solution for a problem, right? You know, there is a problem in front of you. Um, you could go all out to solve it completely end to end. Like you know, I'm a perfectionist like many of you, but but still, you know, to say that the perfection is not in solving the problem fully because understanding that the extent of the problem is so huge that I will not say it's sort of, you know, I, I will not talk to anybody till I have a hundred percent to hundred percent kind of a solution. Right. But instead say that, okay, uh, if this is my idea, how do I prove that this is, I, this idea will not work or work. Right? So get to the shortest and the, like, you know, fail fast this year. Right? That's really very, very important. Whatever you're going to try as an approach, right? So figure out how do I figure out whether it's failure, right? Just sort of go, not a negative mentality as such. So what is that minimal uh, thing that I need to do uh, in order to make sure that this will not fail, right? That's the approach we'll have to take. So for example, when we came out, we said the first thing we have to do is to, um, of course, build a model. Uh, we did uh, the clinical trials. We had a 500 uh, you know, um, uh, patient data and we built the models. And then I said, okay, so these are all in the lab. You know, many of you would have built machine learning um, you know, models and you know, there are different ways of building it. And for publication, what you just, what you need to do is uh, you can take a bunch of uh, a data set and then even have a training set, which is let's say 99% of the data and 1% is tested, right? And then you can also randomize it and then you can actually publish it. But in a real life, it doesn't happen that way. In a real life, what happens, you build a model. It's a software at the end of the day. This software goes and sits in a doctor's office or doctor's, uh, basically a hospital. And it has to look at the unseen data. Something's coming in and they have to, sort of, we have to uh, say yes or no, a cancer or not. Imagine, it's a very, very uh, tough thing. So the first thing very clearly uh, that was in my mind is to see that, will, what are the questions the doctors will ask? Is this really, if that's the end goal, right? The end goal is to go and sit in a hospital 
just go talk to the doctor and say, okay, if this is here, what all are the sort of doubts you have on this? What all will it take for me to sort of get there, right? So first thing um, was basically it has to work. So obviously we came up with some, uh, you know, um, uh, testing and, uh, you know, clinical validation element. Also, does it work, work in the real life, you know, real people when, like I mentioned, we don't know the answer before. So that's the second part. And the third part, as you also alluded to, is the regulatory part. You know, who, see, if you go to a hospital, I don't want to sign. You know, I, I, I don't want to take the liability of your report. Like, you know, is there a way that I can actually offer this to the hospital? So obviously, that is how we went with the end result in mind and saying, what are the gaps? And then said, okay, how do I address each of these problems, right? And um, so I think one strategic decision we did was not to do the hardware. I'm not saying you should not do, anybody should do hard, whatever. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, nobody should do hardware, but definitely we should do. In our case, we said, what is out there, you know, um, which we can leverage and do the Delta, which is actually the innovation. So instead of focusing on building the base, which already exists, which you can actually pull from outside and put together and we can replace later but let's pick it up from whatever it's out there. So for example, thermal camera, I mean, everyone even now asks me, why am I not doing thermal camera? It's so easy. Yeah, it's easy. Why should I do it? There are so many people who are doing it. So focus on what is the value prop? What is your uh, core innovation? And then when you put all your focus on that, it actually moves faster, right? So that's that's one uh, thing. And in the same way, for it said, okay, thermal cameras are there. And long back, of course, um, you know, people, doctors were trying to use thermal cameras for breast cancer detection. So I looked around and said, is there at least one doctor in India or anywhere else who's able to sort of, you know, talk to us and give us some plan and all that. So Dr. Amprakash, sir, who is, uh, it's again, luck has, it, uh, he was in Bangalore. So we went, met him and all that. And uh, I, I told him, sir, you don't have to see our report. Just you have to review and give your, um, you know, guidance uh, on an observation side side. He agreed. So basically what happened was uh, we generated, generated a report and the doctor wrote, wrote his own observations there as well. So the report which went to the end user was not doing any harm to her. The, the scoring probably, for example, score could be 0.9, but he would say no. I mean, it happened very rare. But because of this, what happened? We were, and, and he was signing it. It is a radiologist, very, very senior radiologist signing it. So we got the time to market also very fast because the hardware was outsourced or rather we just picked the off the shelf one. And secondly, the, we found a path to have it, have the, all the liability taken care of, even if we install it in a hospital. I think it's a long answer, but you know, that's sort of uh, the approach we took. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So basically, uh, build what is bare minimum required to set up the credibility, and then you can yeah. work on the peripheral or final. Focus on the core. Or, you say no. Focus yeah. on the core and partner for the rest. Absol absolutely. Because uh, otherwise, you build uh, build the things in totality. You really end up spending so much waste time, time doing things that are time and resources, resources also. Resources so yeah. Also. yeah. You, you are absolutely right. In fact, um, the, that that's a challenge that like we also see with many startups that they wait till the product is ready. And meanwhile, many times even product evolve or requirement evolve and you become redundant. Okay. We talk so, about MVP, right? Minimum yeah, viable product. Absolutely. So even in the product, you work on the features that are most important for the end user yeah. to show absolutely. that everything is new. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and so, so yes, so this is Niramai as of now, but then you begin from scratch when you started and took it out and you also mentioned that like, you know, when you go from zero, sir, and, you know, the treatment huge that you did, huge difference, exactly. And the resource, like, you know, corporate resources are available to you. When you start your own things, like you have to start from the scratch, there is nothing available to you. So what are the bare minimum resources or what kind of team that you really looked into it. And you know, Gita, I would really request you to spend a little more time about the team aspect. How did you choose your initial team? What kind of thing? Because many of our participants are very early stage. Some of them could be from academia. Yeah. And they, like, you know, your, your experience would be very helpful as a researcher when you start, what kind of team you have to put it together. So if you can share thought on that as well. Sure. So um, at the time of starting off the startup itself, right, I um, spoke to uh, two of my team members, Shiva and Himanshu, they're still here. I'm so glad they're part of Niramai. 
right? And then said, okay, boys, if, if you're going to come with me, I'm going to do this because I, I can't do it alone. I mean, it's, it's not possible to do it alone. And uh, they very much uh, agreed to, to, to do that. They said, okay, if you're going to start, you will do it because uh, they also believed in the technology. And uh, uh, one is a data scientist, another is a uh, technologist, right? And also an aging uh, person. And I myself, of course, as you know, sort of, you know I, I, I can do hands-on as well. No, I don't do. Uh, so, so it was more like the core team, right? Because if we decide that the core innovation is going to be ML or AI, but I have that right. right? So that's the first part. Then uh, Nidhi Mato, who was my uh, product manager in, in the lab, uh, you know, um, requested and then said, okay, for the, some of the business uh, things, you know, uh, you know, it'd be good to have a, a focused business person. So, so um, Nidhi and I actually were the official uh, co-founders, but the four of us were actually the founding team members. We came out, came out of um, uh, Xerox also, all the four of us were from a previous organization. Um, and uh, so, so that was the core, right? You, you identify what is your core innovation and figure out that the core team is there in the beginning. So I think that happened. After that, of course, it was really, uh, you know, friends from my network, uh, you know, I'd say, okay, this is the mission. It's all about uh, the founder and the CEOs or, uh, you know, the, all the founders um, uh, transmitting the passion. And, and it's really a mission, right? So when you're starting a mission, I mean, no salary, right? Come on, I also didn't have any salary. Uh, you know, it's, it's like this much, this is like real, I mean, you can imagine a lab director on this. So it's, it's pretty hard. You know, I mean, I used to have a driver and when I had to catch auto and go, I mean, it's lifestyle also changes. It's, it's not easy. I mean, uh, on that first month is not easy, actually, right? And uh, now I'm all used to it. That's a different thing. So, so all that. And uh, so, so I, um, you know, we also had to sort of um, compensate my previous organization for the IP that we had built inside and we're bringing out, though it's the same thing we had done. Uh, so I, um, uh, we had to raise money. So the first uh, month, it was within 90 days, we had to pay them up. So it was very, very tough. Uh, so um, the day one, two, like first one week or first month, our goal was to actually raise funds. And we're thankful we actually made five ventures, Manish Singhul and Makant. And, um, you know, and, um, you know, they were very impressed with the work uh, itself. And, um, you know, they asked lots of questions and so on. But um, uh, we were able to raise uh, $1 million within three months. It was very hard uh, to answer all the questions. A lot of hard work, um, uh, you know, because when you actually face the investors, you know, there were, um, a lot of, uh, you know, unknown answers. I mean, we didn't know many of the answers, you know, it's, it's because you were trying to figure out the first one month. So it's a lot of homework and going back and uh, answering the question and all that. So from a team perspective, uh, to be frank with you, um, we can't be choosers in the beginning. You know, you're not willing to pay much and sort of, you know, people have to align. So, but uh, thankfully from my own friend circle, we have Tara and Revati who joined sort of one from a business side and technical side. That's all we focused. And uh, you, you just have to, as founders, you have to roll up and do, or be ready to do everything, you know, including we have swept the <laughs> floor sometimes too. Obviously, meeting the doctors, you know, talking on stage, everything, you, you know, it becomes like a, it's like a house, right? Literally, you don't sort of worry about doing your own housework. So it's like, so the first, uh, I think, one or two years, we, uh, we didn't have a sort of um, major, um, it was more like Hoover is, Align with the vision. I think that was very, very critical. It's not that whoever is passing by, we picked up. No, obviously they need to have uh, meet the standards and quality required for the for the role uh, in terms of team uh, selection. Uh, but I think um, at least the first 25, 30, uh, you know, I was very particular. I'll talk to them at least once or twice, uh, interview basically, and uh, see the alignment to the vision. I know it's okay if they're coming in uh, because we we could we could pay salary once we raise the first round of funding. Uh, but obviously not market rates, you know, it's really, they have to be there because the problem is interesting. The mission is interesting. So that, that's what we see. The whole, the whole Miramar team is here because, you know, uh, they believe in the mission. I think that's, that's very critical, at least for the first four or five years of the company, maybe, maybe less, but, you know, I've been fortunate to have everyone who's joining in, uh, aligning with the vision. And that's very yeah. Sure. So I hope everyone who is here listening to you very carefully that startup is like you know it's kind of a housekeeping to holding the fort you have to do everything by yourself like but rewards are amazing out there like if you do it rightly then rewards are amazing like you know invaluable uh, interesting so you also talk about this uh, the 
um, investment you got it in, in a very very early stage initial in three months or something like that right and uh, uh, but then uh, three months you have hardly any you know presence out there in investment community how did you build your visibility in in investor community it's very difficult for startups to like, you know keep bouncing from one place to another place so how did you manage to do that so i think one thing that i did was of course we started the company 2 3 months before we actually left the came on ground so um you know you're absolutely on the dot you have to create some visibility in my mind some validation that this there is some stuff in this uh, sort of idea right so um one is uh, you know thankfully because of my sort of long career in corporate i did have some network of people who were um you know accomplished uh, to, uh, in different areas so i used to sort of bounce off the idea and like you know do a short pitch to them tell me what do you think is wrong with this right so it's really about finding out the the fail fast part of it Change, find out what needs to be fixed fast right and that's very important so i used to do that and in that process they will say oh i know this other person do you want me to be so it's kind of the network uh, that you use your current close friends uh, particularly for pi ventures uh, you know my uh, you know Shir, um, shekhar kirani you would know from axel you know i didn't know he was an investor or <laughs> vc uh, before i but we were classmates at iisc so we were just sort of saying hi bye and so uh, it turned out that uh, you know um uh he he heard about me uh, through through my prof and so on and said okay yeah so you should sort of meet and he, he came he came from to sort of introduce me to a couple of investors um and i think that trapo helped uh, you know um it's like a warm reference and not like i am not calling people so i think that was uh, in some cases and other cases are more like you have to be very vocal about what is the uh, you know what what have you achieved in so far right you know be it in your startup be it uh, in your uh, education or previous career or whatever being open about uh, and then building confidence in the investors about the credibility of the uh, the team itself is very important in different forms you can do that you know uh, by showing the knowledge about your product or uh, from your previous experience whatever so many of these uh, i think also uh, from a networking perspective another thing that we consciously did is to uh, sort of uh there used to be this uh, if some of you haven't done it you should, you should do it and i'm not paid for uh, paid from this organization too this is uh, f6s right uh, .com right um angel list and f6s so i used to sort of you know go apply and and if you see there there's a lot of contests and all so we used to go and apply uh, you know to these contests you know we you know we haven't done anything like you know one week old but idea is what we have doesn't matter you try to answer those questions you know imagine you answer those questions you get so much clarity on it, on your own thought process you know what exactly is the business problem you think you know but you ask that again and again, are you sure this is the business problem you saw this is the problem so so you actually sort of when you actually these questions you gain a lot actually so incidentally within 6 months we got entry into some berlin conference they selected on the top and they said like how the hell did we make it right so like this you know these are some of the forums where um, even if you go to top 3 top 5 you actually get the visibility and also like i said we get the clarity of answering so that we did very very proactively startup india startup kannada wherever you know go and register 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 so that we have done heavily uh, so i think that was the only way we were doing initially and after we got funds of course uh, you know media came in and uh, they talked about us quite a bit yeah, yeah. I, i i know that like there's uh, immense media visibility you created in very first year and uh, uh, interesting so you know another thing is that like we talk about investment but today like uh, again like you got it and like you you have really done it so uh, successfully getting early investment on and then showing your prototype much uh, much in like you know early stage of your uh, venture cycle but uh, the still like uh, the venture capital or investment remains an issue in specially long gestation you know the period especially startup having long gestation period and out there there are government who have that's the reason government is actually coming forward and trying to chip in and like you know, trying to fill the gap that like there is a prototype if you have idea then you go about creating prototype there are grants available and all those things uh, so typically like i see that like 90% of entrepreneurs that i have come across 
if not 90% but nearly 80% of entrepreneurs like you know especially in healthcare they start with some kind of government grants and then they yeah. take it forward they build something and all those things in your case i i uh, i believe you also were recipient of some government grant yeah. but you got we see money first and then you went to the government so why no, why we were why doing both we were doing okay. both parallelly okay. we were doing parallel yeah. for the vc yeah. money it was a hell of, it's a lot of money we had to pay up right to even uh, survive uh, for more than 3 yeah. months uh, we had to sort of do the this organization and so so that was uh, yeah so very important and uh, so that was also the reason why uh, you know i had to uh, raise the vc money um but uh, the remaining amount is not uh, you know fully sufficient you know uh, and uh, we actually won uh, karnataka startup elevate 100 program which was about a 25 lakh grant we got and um, so so like that we did uh, we did get government support i think that's a wonderful thing that has happened and it's going to help all of you uh, you know don't think government you know why should i apply for government program so i i think there are lots of advantages of going in for government programs also one is of course visibility Uh, visibility in the right forum, um, uh, you know, and introductions to some government officials. At least you can bounce it off and see, you know, what else do we need to do in order to make it helpful to, um, to the masses. If your uh, if your problem that you're solving is relevant to the masses, for example, and uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, you may actually end up getting some money as well. And yes, they do de decembers. I I was like very skeptical, you know, how will they really give the money, you know? the first first tranche uh, definitely came much faster the second one took more than one year but that's okay but uh, they have been very supportive even now they're very supportive in fact uh, they list us on the top 50 top 10 uh, startups and then uh, proposes to or any of the international uh, incoming um, you know um, delegates and so on so i think uh, it's very helpful to partner with uh, whatever is the local ecosystem available sure yeah So interesting. I still have a couple of questions, but I think we can, like you know, ask for audience question. We take some audience question, and before we conclude, I have one or two that I can bounce it to you sure. if time permitting. Yeah. So one question that, like, we had that how many data did you uh, collect to build AI model? So how much patient data was collected for building AI model? and my after this uh, my colleague uh, shraddha and i will basically travel between two of us on on qna yeah sure so um the first model we built uh, you know with just about 300 patients data right you know because it was you know see machine learning is not about deep learning only so there are different ways of actually you know we can do a full class on and i know many of you are already experts in machine learning so if you could also handcraft it right so those the first model we built was all handcrafted um, features and uh, so with 300 patients about that is 1500 images we were able to sort of get to it and imagine uh, some of it was test set and many of it uh, only a part of it was training set so we were able to do it so we also it's like uh, um on uh, what is that necessity is the mother of invention say you know so we said okay we do have only like uh, 200 samples for training so what do we do so we kind of innovated in the way you do the training we do the building the model so we had to sort of innovate in multiple ways because collecting every bit of data means uh, sort of going into a hospital going through a full uh, you know process of clinical trial approvals ethics committee reviews and so on and then getting in there and then you are asking and and almost every patient who is walking in you have to convince them to come and stand in front of the sort of the thermal imaging device because it's not a normal practice to do thermal imaging so so it's a lot of hard thing so when you see that it takes so much time and effort and uh, you know um uh, general uh, hurdles uh, to actually get to every bit of data then you'll start taking every every data point uh, very very seriously and try and say okay how do i do it with the minimal training all that we have to innovate uh, yeah Not and then like 50000 so that's so uh, nice so we use deep learning right so uh, there are couple of questions which are on technical side so like are the ml techniques applied directly on thermal image or is there some other input data and then there is another like question is that like uh, how do you make sure that the person has cancerous growth using ml is there a database or something which the software refer to yeah so i answer the second one because that's definitely non intuitive and when we were doing it 
I, I was thinking that we should just do it because that's the right way to do it. But now, you know, I think this is a super good idea. What is that? So typically what happens whenever you have an image and uh, you're trying to sort of build a machine learning model, and uh, particularly based on pattern recognition, then you will say you call a bunch of experts and then show them the image and say, is that a cat, cat, cat? And then they'll say, yes, no. Or is it cancer, cancer, cancer? And yes, no. And then you do a, um, um, you know, tagging based on that. You actually set the class label for the training set based on that. What we did was uh, we wanted to show it to the doctors and say, is this cancer? Here's a thermal image, is it cancer? But as I said, not many doctors are using it. I, we had only one doctor in India who were able to read a thermal image, Dr. Ramprakasa. So then um, it will be too biased to have it sort of, we did ask him, of course, he gave us his, his feedback. But then I said, okay, so why don't we use a normal test, right? So every person went through my test, followed by mammography, ultrasound, and biopsy. And we took the biopsy as the uh, label. So once we started doing it, obviously, it's very hard to collect each bit of this data. But when, once we did it, it was almost like the golden truth for it. It's not a, a human judgment. It is a golden truth. It's a biopsy result. So because of that, what happened today, we can, I'm very proud to say that, you know, we have been able to detect many cancers which were not found by mammography. We have been able to detect many more cancers and reduce phosphorus which are not able to be done by humans reading the thermal image. That was a good approach, and that's how we trained. Mm -hmm. What was the question? What the first question? But yeah, it was kind of related. So we used so the thermal image. We used several other information about the patient. Right. Sure. Uh, so Shraddha, can you take take up uh, more some more questions that yeah. you can read it out? Yes, yes. So uh, thank you, um, mm -hmm. ma'am. Uh, there's also several questions in the question answer tab. So a participant is asking, how do you currently protect your patient data uh, that got acquired from the patient? Yeah. Yeah, so protection, if it is like a GDPR protection, so so obviously, I think that we don't, from a privacy standpoint, right, let me start from there. Uh, we do not take any uh, prior, what you call PII, personally identify information, identifiable information. Uh, so we just take the um, scan date and age. We don't take the date of birth, never a name or an email ID or a phone number right now as a part of the data set itself. And the data is, as you saw, it's a thermal image. If you look at it, like there's no face or uh, even RGP to say who whose it is or who it is also. So that way it's uh, just... For example, by, by chance, one image is lost. First is you cannot identify who it is. That's one. Second, obviously, uh, we do use cloud. So we have to use all um, you know um, uh, recommended uh, security practices to uh, push it to the cloud, HTTPS, you know, um, encryption of data in the database, you know, using an S3 bucket, which is, uh, you know, uh, covered, uh, you know, secure and so on, right? All of those uh, things are taken into account. So that is uh, usually how we do it. Yeah. Sure. The another participant is asking about uh, uh, what are the different clinical and regulatory approvals which uh, your product has to go through for commercializing in India. Yeah, in India there is this uh, DCGI organization, um, uh, Drug Controller General of India. In that uh, there is a CDSCO. Don't ask me the expansion. Poini will know. CDSC organization. <laughs> um, uh, so, so we uh, actually, because ours was a non contact, right? So, in um, Indian uh, government regulatory, we have class A, B, C, D, class A, B, C, D, and class A is a non contact device. So, we, we, we come under the non contact, and there's no radiation, so it's basically a non invasive test. So, we are like you no know, low risk uh, device in that sense. Um, and uh, in India, we don't have special regulations for AI-based service, uh, based, uh, medical, like software as a medical device, unlike uh, FDA, for example, US FDA. So, so with that, uh, typically in India, what happens is um, the software takes the uh, risk of the hardware with which it will work. So it became a class A device, which is good. Um, so regulatory said, we will not give you any regulatory clearances, uh, CDSO. But then we had to sort of uh, go to them and say, can you give us a letter saying that this is okay? I mean, it's not notified, it's not uh, regulated. They gave us that letter. Uh, that they do have that process. So we do have a letter of, uh, this was 2018 itself we got early on because that is one of the things. You go to a hospital, you go to a doctor and say, what do you need for you to take this and put it there? We are not asking you to put it now, but just tell me what are the things that you want us to do. So one of them was clearly like, you know, make sure that it is India regulated. So that is what we have to do. Now we are working with EMARC as well as the US FDA 
In fact, just today we heard uh, uh, you know, a precept that response from USFDA. Uh, they're very, very uh, supportive. I mean, you have to ask the right question. And uh, you know, um, not that you know the first application will get it or anything. So there is something called a pre-sub pre-submission. You can go to FDA and then get the answer. So right now we are going through a CE mark, uh, mostly mostly done. Yeah. Audit is pending. Sure. Uh, there is also an interesting question um, uh, from a participant on uh, how is your visionary before and after your you have started your uh, venture. Uh, how far you have achieved your visionary in terms of marketing and further development of business and the current visionary is completely different or it is the same uh, when you have started your venture? Yeah, I think of a vision. Uh, so honestly, when I started, um, I just wanted to make a difference on the ground, right? And, uh, and, and I'm, if you are, of course, COVID time is always uh, a little difficult uh, for various reasons. Uh, but I never thought, you know, within two years, we will reach, let's say, 25 different installations, uh, thousands of people impacted. I, I honestly did not uh, you know, dream of that. And I remember yeah, another thing we did is to go through accelerator programs. You know, for example, Axelor, when we went, you know, uh, Mr. VG, basically, we Ganapati. So he basically said, um, you know, what, are, what do you want to do by next year this month, right? Maybe it was September. He said, next September, what are you going to do? Then I said, maybe we'll do 200 streaming. Because you know, it, I know it's so hard to get data and imagine somebody else taking our test and so do it, right? And he said, so what does it take to actually do this in the next three months? So I was like, sure. Yeah, why don't you think? So so that is the sort of, uh, you know, change you come in, right? You know, what you, what you think, you know, the practical angle you want, like one year. Startup is all about acceleration, doing things, of course, doing right, but doing it uh, in a quick way, at least in the initial part, right? Fail fast angle again, so so we um, you know we did manage to beat uh, in three months we were getting more than two hundred fifty people, which is a lot, which is a big big deal, right? So now we have done thirty two thousand. So I think we have uh, achieved. See what happens is as in when you get into the startup and you start getting like the acceleration mode, um, you are in the speed mode, right? You know. So, but actually what happens, uh, there is a quick uh, step. And after that, it will slow down. You can't go at that same speed all the while. I mean, it, it doesn't work that way. So then you, then your sort of vision slows down a bit. Initially it is slow. Then you say, oh yeah, it is possible. Let's move fast. And so, for example, you know, last year uh, when we were trying to do 30,000 women and all, I said, next year we'll do 1 million. But yeah, I mean, it's, it seems like three times, but three times when it is 300,000 versus, you know, uh, 30,000 to 1 lakh is a lot. Uh, you know, it's the same effort, same value. Thing. So, um, I mean, I really, you know, and now, now I dream very big, you know, so that's, that's where, you know, uh, that's how we are able to take at least a few steps forward. Yeah, sure. So, um, there is also, a, there is a lot of questions from the early stage uh, uh, entrepreneurs, or I can say that the participants are still in the academia and want to pursue a startup route. So they are looking for uh, some sort of guidance from you on how to find out uh, uh, like a good problem statements uh, in the healthcare segment. Probably uh, like particularly the, the case where, uh, I mean, uh, they are trying to relate to your profile actually that uh, your background was in the computer science and uh, your current field, the focus is on in the healthcare sector. So was it like a challenging uh, the shift or how do you manage those challenges? Like shifting from one segment to other segment and that to yeah, pioneering sure. in the other segment, yes. So there are a few things uh, when you, especially you've done something else before, right? Not as a fresh uh, graduate, if you've done something else before, two things you have to remember. One is um, earn, learn, unlearn and learn, right? You always get a feel, oh, 25 I've done, this is not going to work, right? Or this is how you should do. No, that doesn't work the same way, right? Because you're trying to do something very different, very new that nobody else has done before. At least in our case, that's the thing, right? So you have to be really open to say that I may not know. I want to learn from others who have done it. And, and you, believe me, there's nobody in this world who will know better than you. Still, still, right? Uh, for this particular problem, I mean. Still, you can get a bit of uh, guidance from every interaction. So I, I, my principle is every day. Like learn one thing new every day. And uh, from everybody, I think you can, there is something to learn. 
and i always you know feel that and so as long as you are in that learning mode uh, it applies even to your startup again you don't know many things i don't know anything about cancer i started reading up discuss with radiologists i have now have many radiologists friend i can pick up a phone send them a whatsapp if i don't understand you know they will give me and also i remember her mm-hmm. i tell you this i used to go to some medical conference um just first year i went and sat the fibrodynoma fibrocystic that this they were saying i didn't know those terms at all so all i was doing is writing down terms i don't know <laughs> and then coming back and then doing the homework so there are different ways of course you can read books um of course google is great um and so on so you will have to put your efforts uh, talk to experts and get their guidance they are willing to help you know as long as you are not saying you solve my problem it's it's you have some specific time you're conscious about the time uh, they will help you i think le- uh, learning every day is very very important uh, as you know so i had to learn about uh, though i had done some management course you know business models business models that work which product should be there all that is a learning on every day sure uh there is another question from here uh, how did you come up with the valuation during first rounds of funding considering the technology in the early stage bouncer question good question there is no math to it everyone will say you the same thing uh <clears throat> first round it was more like how much money do i want how much equity can i uh, give away right and uh, you know there are several more experts but typically you don't give out more than 25% right you definitely keep it below that uh, but but exactly how much is something depend on how much money you you kind of want to raise uh, and not because i love money it's not like that it's really because you have a plan and you want to do something and that takes that much money it requires that much money just to get enough that is required for let's say next 2 years or so because it it takes time so what i realized the first time like i thought oh got it because we were lucky i guess and we got the right connections uh, we were able to raise within 3 months and um, um and and we had enough proof points for that particular stage i guess um however when we went for uh, series a which was last year uh it did take quite some time like you know more than 6 months 8 months to actually get to a term sheet and then after that 5 uh, 6 months to actually sign and get the money in the bank almost like a close to a, a close, 10 to 1 10 months to 1 year to actually get the money in the bank so it takes time so you have to have enough runway so you plan in a way that it's at least 2 years uh, and then uh, go for it um and and it's not about sale it's not like the highest valuation you get you know your best or anything it's really about um you know making sure the investors are your partners you know you don't have to negotiate and pull, pull them down or anything they are going to be with you right so they have to be they have to first align with your vision uh, it should be a win win basically they i need this much money and for this and they believe they trust you because they are also interested in your growth right so that is when they go right so but it has to be very transparent right this is what it is this is where i don't know this is where the gap these are the risks and so this is the amount i need right so that's literally it's about what is the need and um, uh, you know how much is a fair thing to part you know uh, yeah and of course for the second round uh, we did a lot of, i mean a lot of reading i read books and you know how do you do valuation all that uh, you know there are some guidelines and sort of you know i had to give justifications to the investors to do that but i guess that helped a bit but you can try to do that also sure 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 so uh, probably the last question when you are the, muted yeah uh, yes so probably the last question now uh, there is a question on the startup life cycle that how does it look like uh, the healthcare startup life cycle do, do you build your product first or do you go for the like uh, applying for various grants competitions and awards and the uh, looking for the investment but i think uh, this go hand in hand it's a parallel process uh, but just would like to uh, know your views on this it's a good question and trust me i'm thinking on the ground here and the one picture that's coming in my mind is a is this um is a jatka wheel <laughs> any spokes okay if the wheel has to move all the spokes have to move like you know it will move forward right so really everything has to be together trust me like you cannot say this is important this is not important in a startup like we said you have to do everything 
So you have to make sure your business model is right. You have to make sure your tech is right. You have to make sure your product is uh, experience, uh, product experience is good. Um, you have to make sure you have a good projection of the future. You have to make sure you have the regulatory clearances. You have to make sure you have money in the bank. You have, you have to make sure wherever possible you grab the money, which is grants. <laughs> and uh, you know you have to keep all ears and nose and any senses you have everything open, uh, always alert and. Um, in all the ways you have to sort of move forward. And uh, the only thing is you move all of it together. So there is a incremental, um, incremental growth in every, every uh, vector that uh, we talked about, right? So there's a progressive way. So it is possible in some months there is a peak, right? Let's say, for example, in the beginning, you actually invest a lot of uh, effort in your own. It depends on how much, for example, one way to judge, right, is to say, what percentage of the CEO's time is being spent in which area? So that is the sort of the focus, right? So I make it very conscious. This week is going to be this one because otherwise, you know, you can't do too much. Of course, I do the other things also. Otherwise, other teams suffer. But the first few months will be fully, right? You make product readiness, right? Having a MVP, working MVP is very important. Once you have that, making sure, or actually alongside, but hopefully, once you have that, you also make sure that all the sort of the UI aspect, everything just together, like I said, but you make sure that the customer experience is, is not, uh, you know, so for that, you'll have to meet the customers, make, you know, show them the product, make the slides and all that. And then when you decide to go to the market or when you want to pitch, then you have all your financials ready. Then uh, uh, when you go to the customer, you have, you think, uh, what does the customer want? You have to go into the customer shoe, right? So that's very much true. And then say, okay, if I were in the customer shoe, what is that I would expect from? So that aspect is very, very important. And I try you try to do that for every stakeholder. If it's a distributor, so you say, okay, if I were Diramai's distributor, what is that I would expect? Obviously, I want highest commission and all that. But then, you know, I mean, like what's reasonable? So you try to think to both ways, right? So it's actually sort of easier to move. But uh, yeah, wheel, right? All the spokes have to move together. So that's uh, that's how I will see. Yeah, that's good. It's, it's great. Now, as I told you, like, I have some last question that I would like to ask. And sure. here is like, you know, something which I want to bring in women, as woman aspect here. Yeah. So, uh, see, women in STEM itself is not very high and women entrepreneur or women entrepreneur, like, you know, that number is really, really small. So the, tell me one thing that, uh, how did you like did you did you really face any struggle because of your gender or what what you have done so differently to overcome so so, so struggle like you know if you like to share your views on that as well um so um yeah it's true that uh, a number of women in stem or number of women in leadership positions are much lower uh, it does throw some challenges. I won't uh, hide that. And I think uh, for you, you would also face the same thing. Uh, you know, for example, we were only two girls in, when I did my master's in IAC. Many times only girl because we were choosing different courses. Um, and then uh, when I was a Hewlett Packard or, uh, you know, and also I'm talking about researcher, right? Uh, yeah, only girl in the team. <laughs> and uh, when I also got into the management uh, staff and so on only girl on the table so i sort of it does have a challenge um that what happens is that uh, you know basically i'm not like an outgoing person i generally don't speak on my own and all that but you have to just sort of fight that internal sort of your own personality and uh, think about what you're trying to do sort of for that what what is need to be done so i uh, what it's been hard to actually sort of uh, express, uh, like for example, when you express an idea, I remember I won't say where, um, the first thing is that, oh, that idea won't work. I mean, it's so easy. You are like 10 people say, come on, your voice won't, won't, won't be heard at all, right? You know, you say three times, he, 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 here. Okay, so they'll hear. Say, come on, this won't work. That's exactly how it used to start. And then I used to go back home. You know, I you know my husband will tell you how many night outs I used to do. Okay, some idea, somebody said it didn't work. He used to tell me because I used to go back. You know, pull up my Python. My Python is beautiful. Some of you do that, right? So I used to build the whole POC in three days. <laughs> and then say, you said it won't work. Here is where it works. You know, I used to go back and prove that. And clearly, I think uh, 
many times, you know, I've tried to sort of do double the work that like, so for example, Absolutely. it's, it's not, I'm not blaming anybody and it's just very natural. I guess if you put a bunch of girls and one boy, we would probably do differently. Right. So that's, that's how it is. So, um, especially when it comes to ideas and all, a lot of ego clashes will happen. Uh, so, so this, this has happened and I, I take that to my advantage. You know, you asked about acceleration. How do you do it quickly? Probably that is also another uh, boon, right? You know, because I've been alone fighting this kind of, you know, trying to prove do, uh, to prove myself, right? I'm able to sort of bring that to Nirma as well. I mean, I, I just first time I'm thinking that way, but probably, yeah, you know, that that also is a trait that built uh, got built into uh, me. And of course, I have a wonderful team. Uh, you know, no no reduction uh, to the effort that you know, my team has been in. But I'm saying in terms of the leadership and setting goals and so on, there's a more an acceleration you know, that you'll see. And that's uh, thanks to that. And um, yeah, I mean, of all, as women, of course, we have the family, uh, we have to sort of manage that and this. And um, I have a very um, you know, understanding family that especially, you know, after Nirama, it's been like 24 bar seven, for sure. If, if there's more, you know, sleeping at 3 a.m., getting up at 6 a.m. is very, very common and so on. So uh, it's just the, just the intent to, uh, uh, build something big, bigger than yourself. It's I'm not doing it for like you know myself or sort of making money or you know uh, becoming famous or anything. I really want to make uh, change the things on the ground. So I guess that yeah. going and fighting. Yeah. So so yeah yeah. This is really good to hear. And like you know, I, I, when I say that whether like be it a woman or male, you need to have certain. Traits basically to be an entrepreneur. When you mention about it, right, that uh, you have to believe in your vision, but also kind of pushing require. And Gita, I have seen you. You remember, like we were together in a delegation in Sweden, and you literally gate crash without any uh, appointment in a hospital in a mammograph center, and like you know, people were <laughs> you force people to respond to you. And these, are places, and then these are the places that like, you know, uh, not known to be, you know, going there without appointment. So this uh, was you saw me, you saw me get crashing into a dead oh, diagnostic center. You, yeah. you can't, you have to be totally shameless about it as an <laughs> entrepreneur, yeah. So that is very, yeah. So yeah, pleasure talking to you, Gita. It's really wonderful talking to you and so nice to like, we spend time together. I know your story, but uh, again, it's always good to rehear them again and again. And I'm sure that uh, participants also have got quite a bit out of this. Uh, uh, few things that I wanted to basically, you know, announce here before we say, uh, like, you know, we wind up this thing. So first thing is that uh, for all the participants here, if you have interest in healthcare, um, the area there is a BIG call from BIREC is going on. Big is bioignition grant, which is uh, like a grant support up to 50 lakhs to convert your idea into prototype. Sign is one of the big partners, and we weekly organize uh, question and answer session as well as a big awareness session. So please keep watching on our our uh, website and our social media. Uh, announcement we also keep doing lots of webinars uh, which are uh, uh, essentially focusing on entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial traits and aspects and other business related elements so uh, keep watching those things also and Gita my promise I st still remain unfortunately we are in lockdown mode the moment we became normal we would like to have Niramai coming and ho hosting it's like you know camp breast cancer uh, scanning camp at, at IIT Bombay. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you thank very you much, Pani. And uh, Dr. Shanda, it's been excellent talking to you all. Thank if you anyone uh, has uh, any further questions, uh, they can write to me at geeta at Yeah, Thank you. Thank you, Geeta. Pleasure talking to you. Bye-bye. Enjoy. Yeah. All the best. All the best to all the entrepreneurs. You're doing the right thing. Way to yeah. go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.